distinguished faculty members, undistinguished faculty members. <laughs> there must be a few. <laughs> and students, and particularly families, because I know this is a great day in your life. I just left my speech over here, so excuse me. I am honored to be here to be asked to, to present this, this address um, and to be asked to speak to imminent graduates of a great university. In effect, I'm speaking to the future. I've done this many times before. Trouble is I'm getting older and audiences, you, are getting younger. So it's harder to know what to expect from these occasions. But I will tell you, I once went to speak to Wales in Wales to a college gathering and there was a bit of a mix-up. At the appointed hour, there was only one person in the audience. I waited a few minutes, no one else arrived, so I decided to speak. <laughs> when I finished, to the sound of one man politely clapping, I asked him if he cared to go out for a drink. <laughs> Thank you, he said, but I can't do that, I'm the next speaker. I'm, I'm glad you all came because I was terrified of being lonely up here. <laughs> Despite the obvious age gap, all of us here have something surprising in common that is unusual and unexpected. More than 40 years ago, I was a 20-year-old student at Oxford University. Like all of you, I was preoccupied with games, grades, and exams, except for one enormous distraction that year, the Cuban Missile Crisis, and the poss possibility of nuclear war. I had Khrushchev to worry about, you have Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump. <laughs> that, that wasn't a political statement, that's just a fact. <laughs> same fears, same insecurity, different dictator, different president. No editorial there. In the UK, we took this international crisis very seriously. Lectures were canceled. Air raid shelters were assigned. My closest friend on the faculty deserted us, packed up his bags, alcohol, and rations, and fled to the Welsh mountains. Be warned. We went nervously to our air raid shelter, which turned out to be what luck, in my case, the college wine cellar. <laughs> it was the first and only time I got into that cellar, the first time I ever drank Napoleon brandy, and in the end, we didn't go out with a bang so much as a hangover. <laughs> that crisis was, of course, skillfully averted when the American president, JFK, in effect, called the dictator's bluff. So here we are, decades later, once again on the brink, wondering whether our fragile world is truly threatened, wondering why any political leader could possibly imagine that nuclear war could be anything but a global catastrophe. After all, a couple of shootings in the Champs-Élysées can bring Paris to a standstill. Or one missile, what would it do to DC? And what would a nuclear shootout do to the Korean Peninsula? So many of us are wondering why we're beginning to feel the renewed chill of yesterday's Cold War and wondering why we allow its icicles to polarize our politics today as if we have learned nothing. President Kennedy, after the missile crisis, reminded us that change is the law of life and those who look only to the past or present are certain to, the miss, to miss the future. There's probably no point in my suggesting to all of you that you live in an age of acceleration, a point in history when everything is speeding up. Many of you already feel an imperative to be nimble just in case you miss your chance. The author and astronaut, Gerald Hawkins, came up with the idea of mind steps, dramatic and irreversible paradigm shifts that have taken place over the course of history, accompanied and precipitated by important technological shifts. He predicted they'd happen quicker and quicker as we developed, and he was right. When I was at Oxford in the 60s, we had no phone, no access to a phone. It took around 35 years for one quarter of the US population to have a telephone and a radio. 
of between 47 and 55, just eight years, 50% of this population acquired a television, and it took just six years for 25% of us to have a PC. Gordon Moore, whose Moore's Law famously prophesied in 1965 that computing power, based on the number of transistors you can fit on an integrated circuit board, would double every two years, later shortened to 18 months. While doubling intuitively sounds linear, the mathematicians among you will know that this is actually represents an exponential growth rate. When I was 22 years old looking for my first job, I fantasized about becoming an American television reporter. I'd watched Ed Murrow, the renowned CBS News correspondent, on the BBC interviewing America's greatest. I sent application letters to all the New York TV stations. I received one reply. It was from CBS who simply said, we don't give jobs without an interview. In six months, I saved enough money by driving a delivery truck around England to, bo to book a passage on the SS United States. I showed up at the CBS personnel office in New York City, clutching my pathetic resume, and announced, I'm here for my job interview. <laughs> it never occurred to me I was taking a risk. I was in a hurry. Thinking about risk, though possibly sensible, is an unwelcome deterrent when you're young. And as my ship sailed beneath the Verrazzano Bridge on a glorious February morning, I was carried along on a tide of optimism. I didn't need to be told that America was great. The evidence was all around me. <laughs> risk be damned. I had $100 in my pocket. I owned one brand new British suit for my interview, which was stolen two days after I arrived. <laughs> I didn't say America was perfect. <laughs> I had a dollar a night room in a hostel on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, next door to the Bowery. But CBS gave me a job. Not a great job. I was a log clerk tracking commercials and answering viewers' phone calls. You mentioned the Ed Sullivan Show. I did answer viewers' phone calls on Ed Sullivan, and my favorite day was when was shrieking teenagers came on the, one shrieking teenager came on the phone and asked me if they could speak to one of the Beatles. And I said, sure. <laughs> so I imitated foot, footprints, footprints, footfalls, and I said, excuse me, do you want to speak to me? <laughs> I'll sing you a song. Listen, do you want to know a secret? Do you promise not to tell? Whoa, whoa, that was it. That was as good as I get. <laughs> and then I was drafted into the US Army. You're supposed to groan now, you're supposed to. Or cheer, I don't know which, anyway. My green card made me eligible, who knew? Three months after I'd started my great adventure in America, I was measured for an army uniform in South Carolina, and a year later I was on a troop ship to Vietnam, which I thought of as the unpromised land. Much later, for memory, I was ordered to take a detachment of men to fill sandbags at a lonely crossroad outside Saigon. A convoy was forming alongside us, and it was uncomfortable, back-breaking work in the blazing sun. Time for another risk. I decided that enough was enough, so I drove my comrades in our jeeps to the nearest bar. When we returned to base, we found it in an uproar. The Viet Cong had actually ambushed that convoy, killing several soldiers. It was logically assumed by my commander that my men and I might have been among the casualties. I explained that we had left because the area didn't seem secure, and besides, we didn't have any guns or rifles. I had disobeyed orders, but my brothers in arms were extremely grateful and I was enormously popular. <laughs> Moral of the story, you take a risk when you refuse an order, but only if your judgment can't be defended. Every time I see a sandbag, I remember that distant crossroad where my whole adventure could have ended. When I first worked at CBS in 1965, no one left, no one died, no one wanted to leave because there was nowhere better to be. This led to two outcomes. 
employees would spend 40 years in the same company and many years in the same job, and secondly, it was very hard to get into that business in the first place. But when I returned to the company from Vietnam, I had three jobs in 10 years. In each case, I left them because those jobs no longer existed, outpaced by cultural and technological change. This was a shock to the Ed Murrows of this world, and many did not survive it. The term, as you will have found out, job for life, has become a pejorative. I was lucky to work at CBS in a real inflection point in the power of the networks. During my time with legends Walter Cronkite, Dan Rather, and Bill Moyers, we had audiences in the tens of millions. My own broadcast, the CBS Evening News, had a share, 26 share, and it's now nine. It was probably the last time the White House regularly watched network news live on television. They watch cable now. I remember we used to have a special phone that would ring when the administration wanted to get in touch. I always got somebody else to answer it. They never rang to compliment us, and that hasn't changed. But traditional networks were beginning to fragment and audiences were diminishing. The golden years faded as new competition and a new technology began to, quote, disintermediate traditional businesses. There have been a number of critical points in my career, but one was when I was an executive in the news division and had to take part in a public debate about the future of television. The question was asked whether cable would disrupt the dominance of the major networks. One after another, my senior colleagues on the panel ridiculed the idea and explained that the US public disliked change and was satisfied with networks. So we had nothing to fear. Then at last, it was time for me to speak. I said that the public liked competition, embraced change, and if cable television came up with the right product, viewers would watch it. Dangerous talk. As it happened, in the audience was the new owner of the CBS Corporation, and three months later, he put me in charge of the entire network. Risk occasionally pays off. Now, whether that was prescience or just an unhealthy determination to embrace change or a foolhardy enthusiasm for challenging senior people or just remembering my army experience on obeying orders, I can't tell you. But it was for me the beginning of an understanding that you will have to look to work with, that you have to constantly look over your shoulder because the future may be coming at you. Every executive in the business now has to, now has to wonder what needs to be preserved at all costs and what needs to evolve or be changed or risk redundancy. And what about television today? Well, Ed Murrow, in a speech quoted in George Clooney's movie, Good Night and Good Luck, was concerned for the future of television. In 1958, he worried that this instrument can teach, it can illuminate, yes, and it can even inspire, but it can do so only to the extent that humans are determined to use it for those ends. Otherwise, it's merely wires and lights in a box. I was at CBS News long enough to know what the great correspondent would have thought of fake news. After CBS, I spent 15 years at Sony, and I learned a number of contemporary lessons from Japan, too. Perhaps more than any other company on the planet, Sony walked into the digital revolution backwards. In the 1990s and 2000s, it owned the personal audio market. The Walkman was the dominant industry standard. There was a time when 70% of all user-generated content was either captured, edited, or uploaded on a Sony device. But they didn't see the digital storage revolution coming and were caught napping. Part of Sony's problem was that what had been called the NIH mentality, or not invented here. At Sony, there was a feeling that if a particular product was not invented by Sony engineers, scientists, or technicians, then it had less value and was not to be used in our projects. As a consequence, there was a bias towards proprietary systems which is fine in an analog world, but as you all know, the digital revolution blew that out of the water. Sony was too slow to respond. Apple with their iOS app platform and then Google with their Android open platform had the right ideas. Curating a space where others can create and interact is now a better model for success than closed systems. When you own the area in which others innovate, you become the framework within which others can change. Steve Jobs made many visits to Tokyo, watched Sony hardware products being made, and admired the company's craftsmanship. But he saw dis different advantages, and he outmaneuvered us and built the software to exploit it. The world had changed. 
My experience at Sony was deeply bound in my experience of Japan. The strength and weaknesses of the company and the nation made a profound impression upon me. Pride and a sense of stability gives Japan enormous strength, but can leave it powerless in the face of a shifting world. Big firms cannot expect to live forever. Now, they cannot expect to last more than a couple of decades. Disintermediation, there's that word you should remember, our old technology interrupted and invaded by new technology is now a continual process and we must run to keep up. Sony and the nation it reflected found adapting to this difficult and unpleasant. You wake up to find yourself Yahoo, Googled or Facebook in the same way that AOL had been a few years earlier. So faced by the acceleration, the velocity of this world, what can you do, what can we do? Adapt and die, or die, is all very well, but do I have any more practical advice? <laughs> it's worth first remembering that we should not let perfect be the enemy, the un upgradable good. The race to market and the speed of information is so fast that getting a product, getting an idea out there may matter more than its perfection. You see that all around you. We need to be able to take risks and accept that some of them will not pay off. And we have to be willing to simply correct our mistakes. I remember when Sir David Frost, the British interviewer, was hosting a radio record request program. Ladies and gentlemen, he said, I am delighted to read a music request from Mrs. Anthea Higgins, who is 111. You could hear a shuffling of papers, a pause, and then, correction, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to reread a request from Mrs. Anthea Higgins, who is ill. <laughs> Come on, you have to get it. You have to work at that one. <laughs> if you understand the joke, you get another PhD. <laughs> In an era of disruptive technology, we need to allow ourselves to be disrupted out of complacency. It's no surprise to me that Instagram was developed by 13 guys in a startup rather than by Kodak or Canon that Facebook, a company that had only got going 18 months previously, bought Instagram for a billion dollars because it missed the option to create it. Says reams about how quickly you can go from newcomer to establishment. WhatsApp sold for 19 billion when it was five years old. Facebook and Google, unlike many of their predecessors, clearly see the dangers of the next disruptive technology. They buy up their competition as it appears before it can threaten them. So all those executives in the early part of my career at CBS who spend a lifetime at the same company, God bless them, couldn't know that their successors would end a period of unplanned obsolescence. All of us simply have to learn to live with it. Many of you, I hope, will hope that it's a time of great opportunity as the old strictures and attitudes fall away. It is, after all, an entrepreneur's paradise. If I'd been 18 today, I might not have run off to America for a better environment. It's an exciting time. Everyone with a Facebook page can be a publisher. Everyone with a mobile phone is a videographer. Media technology is available to millions. A few months ago, I went to a meeting of the Founders Forum, a community for global entrepreneurs founded by an inspirational Brit, to bring together aspiring and inspiring CEOs, as well as investors in media and technology. It was a two-day debates, discussions, and experiments in problem solving, as well as ad hoc competitions in creating on-the-spot startups. My group tried to generate interest in an app that would solve addiction to the smartphone. We called it Phonaholic. Problem was, it wasn't clear that anyone wanted to be cured. <laughs> I suspect that every high school and college should have its own version of Founders Forum. Probably you do. It's really an attempt not just to make money, but to understand that economics, the dismal science, can be a playground for creative imaginations. They might also understand why engineers can be the poets of the practical world. Doing, for all of you, is more exciting than listening. So it's never been more fun to be a startup wannabe as long as you're brave and not bashful. And there will be losers. I was one once. When I left CBS, I, I joined a company that was going to make, put television over the copper wire and migrate, migrate as soon as possible to broadband. I was sponsored by three major phone companies, they got bored and didn't, thought it would take too long, and they closed my company down. I found out that having a percentage of nothing is, in fact, nothing. <laughs> Fifteen years later, that dream was restarted, and now there's Verizon Fios Television delivering TV the way we anticipated. Startups can be shutdowns, and 
and you all have to be aware of it. Some of you may have read a business book, The Inventors, The Innovators' D Dilemma. The book explains how companies stop innovating as they become too big to manage, become more concerned with protecting what they have rather than chasing the new. Great companies like Nokia, Sony, Microsoft, and the BBC love their own history, and they adopt what you call a rowing boat mentality. They row towards the future, but they're facing backwards, gazing at the past. That's a stranglehold to forward thinking. By the time those companies pay attention to the cheap new innovations they'd ignored, it's too late, and the innovations steal the future, and you, many of you will steal that future too. That's the innovator's dilemma. You don't want to say, how the hell did that happen? You want to be able to say, we saw it coming and took care of it. I remember Sony's marketing tagline for our Godzilla movie was, size matters. I found out it was the size of our losses. To the flip side of that truism is something President Clinton said about big government. He could just easily, easily have said it about big companies. Running a big company is like running a cemetery. There are thousands of people underneath you, but nobody's listening. So where do all of you go from here? Ben Franklin observed that the US Constitution only guarantees the American people the right to pursue happiness. You have to catch it yourself. Obstacles and setbacks will abound, but if you see life for what it is, all of you, in the spirit and happiness that you feel today, and see it as a great adventure and embrace risk, you may well be amused as well as happy and, yes, fulfilled. I leave you with three key words to live by, all beginning with C. They are my mantra for personal momentum. And yes, I know that cliche begins with a C, but forgive me for these suggestions. My three words are courage, commitment, and conviviality. Courage is self-evident. Nothing meaningful gets accomplished without courage. The most underestimated aspect of courage is the courage to change. Somebody wise and witty once observed that human beings tend to stick to the status quo long after the quo has lost its status. Adapt or die no longer seems melodramatic as it once did because today, it applies to the human race as well as individuals. C, C for commitment, is therefore vital because whatever any of us choose to do, goals have to be addressed with passion and purpose. The last C is going to surprise you, so listen carefully. It's C for conviviality. It is hard to accomplish anything particularly in media and communication alone. Your personality will probably open more doors than your brain. Demonstrate that you are a positive personality, willing to share, willing to give credit, willing to communicate, and eager to learn. Your three speakers demonstrated that. Um, I think in the last speaker's case, the eagle has landed. I chair the Board of Trustees of a great graduate film school in LA, the American Film Institute Conservatory. From the moment students enroll, they form teams to make their first movies. These teams win multiple Oscars every year. They stick together and they succeed together. If you do the same, I'm, so, I'm sure you will echo their success. So look to your neighbor and, and look at he or she next to you and think about how long you'll stay to know them and how long knowing them is going to be a huge advantage. Don't walk out of here alone. And if you do that, I think you will have as much success as all those Oscar winners. So I want to congratulate you from the bottom of my heart and wish you all the best of luck, and I hope your parents are as proud as they should be. Thank you very much. <laughs>